Hi guys and ladies, welcome to another video. Today I have a Perfumers Portfolio Series episode for you guys and uh, it is a somewhat divisive figure in the fragrance community. I will say when I first really heavily started to get into fragrances, you know, five years back, whatever it was, I was not the biggest fan of this gentleman and we're going to have a double um, series today. We're going to have a, a two-parter because we're going to cover the fragrances from the perfumer Jean-Claude Elena, along with his protege at Hermes, uh, Christine Nigel. I only have a couple from Christine Nigel, but I've got a handful from Jean-Claude Elena. And Jean-Claude Elena was a perfumer that I must admit, when I, like I said, when I first started my journey here, I was not the biggest fan because he was kind of almost like a minimalist. I felt like everything he did were these very light watercolors, you know, um, you know, very watery strokes and, and minimalist feel. There weren't a lot of notes. I was really into the older Guerlains like Heritage and stuff like that, where there's 22, 24 notes, complex perfumery. And Jean-Claude Elena, I thought was kind of the opposite of that. Somebody who was selling, um, you know, a very minimalist style, if you will. And I thought that that was boring. And I am definitely man enough to admit that I was wrong. His his style is interesting in a different way. You have to really look for, um, you know, the transitions and the intricacies. They don't just hit you in the face. With most of his fragrances, one of them I'm going to talk about, they do. And I think he did that on purpose on that one to... Um, you know, honor its past. But before we uh, hop into these two perfumers and the perfumes in my collection from these two perfumers, um, I have a coffee recommendation for you guys. I was drinking this, so I figured I'd show you. This is my favorite iced coffee. You can buy this on Amazon. It's a Japanese iced coffee called Boss. Uh, look at that guy. He looks happy, doesn't he? Uh, this is great stuff. Okay. Uh, before we um, get going with the perfumes from Jean-Claude Elena and Christine Nigel, a quick breakdown on this video, and I'm going to do Scent of the Day like I always do, but the reason for this series is the average consumer doesn't know the man behind the curtain, They don't, or woman behind the curtain in the case of uh, Christine Nigel, and more and more women perfumers are really making a name for themselves nowadays. Uh, and, you know, most people see these fragrances and they think, oh, this is a Cartier, this is a Creed, you know, this is a Tom Ford. Tom Ford must develop the fragrances. They don't realize the perfumers behind the scenes, right? So this is a effort to maybe try to put some information out there on the perfumers. Um, there's a brand, Frederick Mall, who is well known for doing that, putting the perfumer's name right there on the packaging on the box and on the bottle, giving them credit. Uh, Frederick Mall was so enraged by the fact that, um, I believe it was Edward Fleischier did not get um, credit for the Poison release at Dior. They had a huge party in the 80s when Poison came out and they didn't even mention him. And that really ticked Frederick Mall off. So, um, you know, it's been more and more of a trend of full disclosure and, um, you know, not trying to hide the fact that you're the perfumer. There's a book out recently by um, uh, a gentleman uh, named, the book is called um, Ghost Perfumer. And it's about the House of Creed and how Olivier Creed and Pierre Bourdon worked together or didn't work together. How, you know, Pierre Bourdon's formulas were basically used and Olivier Creed pretended to be the perfumer in essence is what the book claims. That's not my claim. That's the book's claim. Don't sue me, Creed. Um, so, you know, that kind of information tends to come out in the brand and there's other brands that um, shall remain nameless. There's some people who are pretty sensitive about other brands that shall remain nameless who also have a bit of a scandal going on in that department. Brand owners who claim to be perfumers probably won't take you long to Find out who I'm talking about if you don't know. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm doing this video, to try to shine, shine some light on the perfumers. They deserve credit. Um, a lot of times they have to sign these disclosures that say they can't talk about the fact that they were the creation. In fact, the guy who um, created um, Aventus, um, Jean-Christophe Herrault, 
couldn't talk about it for a decade, basically. He, he created the most uh, influential perfume, you could say, at least in the niche world. Uh, that is the most cloned, copied, you know, imitated fragrance of the last decade. And imagine, he created that and he couldn't even talk about it. Uh, so that's what this video is about. It's to give credit to these perfumers. That's that's kind of um, a quick breakdown. Now let's do scent of the day. Let me grab my microfiber cloth because I want these to be clean for you guys. No fingerprints. I don't want any fingerprint police coming my way. Okay, so the first one is my scent of the day. And God, this is such a fantastic fragrance. It's called Santos de Cartier. The first masculine fragrance ever released for men by the House of Cartier in the year 1981. And, um, you know, I I have a, I love this fragrance so much. I was actually telling Rich Mitch, I haven't worn this fragrance in 10 months almost. Because uh, I track every fragrance I wear and what day. And, um, oh my God, it's so good. It's aromatic. There's that basil, lemon, verbena, galbanum narrowly in the opening. It's just stunning. But then it goes into this spicy vetiver with rosemary and, and cloves and sage. If you don't like cloves, though, still give this a try because the way the cloves are used here are absolutely stunning. Now, this is an older bottle, but I hear that the new reformulation is quite nice as well, but I've never tested it, so I can't speak to that. Um, but if you can find one of these older bottles that looks like this... Uh, the cap is, uh, Rich Mitch says the cap is terrible, uh, but I think it's totally 80s. I love it with that gold contrasted against the silver and that ambery looking bottle. You know, it came out in a time of Koros, Antaeus, so it's competing with some real powerhouses. This is more of the gentleman's fragrance, and I, I do have a bone to pick. On Fragrantica, where did I see that? I thought I saw a, a, a um, quick breakdown. Yeah, here it is. It says, Camp Santos is the first fragrance for men by the Jewelry House of Cartier. This is an elegant fragrance for colder weather or for evening. The base notes are galbanum. So this is from directly from Fragrantica, on, from the brand itself, I guess. Galbanum, carnation, neroli, patchouli, sandalwood. The attractive packaging has the warm color of dark amber that suggests pleasant pleasures of the Orient. The perfume was launched in 1981. I don't think this is only a winter or colder weather scent. I think you could wear this as a signature scent anytime. It's gonna be 80 degrees here on March 17th in Texas, and this smells absolutely stunning. Someone said there's some cumin note that comes out when it gets warm. For me, I, I just get this beautiful aromatic, ultra-masculine. Uh, Danielle uh, Moliere created this, and it is a, you know, it is backup bottle worthy. Obviously, I, I, I have a lot of juice left, but, um, the fact that I don't have a backup bottle of this kind of makes me a little bit nervous because I never want to run out of this as long as I'm alive. Okay, now we're going to get to the perfumes from the from Jean-Claude Elena and Christine Nigel. I want to read a quick blurb from Parfumo for, for Jean-Claude Elena. Um, I love Parfumo, by the way, Parfumo.net. What a great site. It says, Jean-Claude Elena has an awe-inspiring answer ready when asked about the secret of his success. Friendly resistance. He sees himself as a polite naysayer, which is also the recipe for his unbroken success story as a nose. The only classic thing about him is his preference for timeless fragrances. Born in Grasse as the son of a perfumer, his path into the world of fragrances was predetermined. However, his high school performance was so poor, uh, I'm sorry, his school performance was so poor that he was denied higher education and therefore never completed formal education at one of the large cadre forges. However, he was fascinated by perfumes enough to join Givaudan in Switzerland in 68. I didn't realize it was that long ago. <laughs> Where he learned the basics of perfume composition from scratch. There, he was soon able to draw attention to his talent and score numerous point landings for the traditional house. In 92, the German company Harman and Reimer, now, now known as Simrise AG, approached him. In 2004, he moved to Hermes, where he served as chief perfumer until 2015. Since then, he has put his good nose to work as a sought-after freelancer on notable projects. Jean-Claude Elena no longer has to prove anything to anyone. He can look back on over 50 creations that he's composed for Hermes alone. In addition, 
He has created Bulgari, Frederick Mall, La Tizan, Van Cleef and Arpels, Balenciaga, Cartier, Yves Saint Laurent, Christine, uh, Christian Lacroix, Giorgio Armani, and on and on and on. The modest superstar lives and works near Gras. He describes himself as a writer of fragrances as each perfume begins with handwritten notes of his thoughts. A writer of fragrances is very interesting. Um, this talent has led him to publish two highly acclaimed books along the way. In 2012, his diary, The Dreamed Scent, from the Life of a Perfumer and Perfume, uh, a guide to the world of fragrance. In total, he received the uh, he received the FIFI Fifi Award uh, of the Fragrance Foundation six times. In 2015, the German Perfume Award uh, Doof Stars uh, followed his life's work. Success cannot be planned, says Jean-Claude Elena in one of his rare interviews. Every new fragrance is like an adventure journey that has to be pursued. And the best way to do that is by following your nose. So I love those little blurbs Parfumo does on some of the more popular perfumers. Uh, Christine Nagel does not have one, but that's Jean-Claude Elena. That's a quick breakdown. And I want to start with a fragrance that um, Parfumo actually doesn't credit as being Jean-Claude Elena. So if anyone knows for sure if this is a Jean-Claude Elena, let me know. Uh, but Fragrantica does. So I'm, I'm putting this in here, but I know Fragrantica can be wrong sometimes. This is Rochas Globe. This is a 15 ml bottle. Uh, I have another 15 ml bottle like this to back this up. Um, but this is basically almost like a spicy uh, floral, you know, uh, woody musk, I guess you could call it. Uh, it's discontinued, unfortunately. God, this Santos is just beautiful. It's so good. Um, the, the opening is um, a little bit spicy. It almost has that, what makes me think this is a Jean-Claude Elena and it, is it has that touch of cumin in the opening. You get this spicy cumin-like vibe, but it only shows caraway, coriander, and tarragon as the opening spices. With lemon and bergamot. The heart is carnation, old school carnation. I love, uh, needs to come back as a note. Bring back carnation, guys. Geranium, jasmine, lily of the valley, rose, and then balsam fir. So you do get this green. This is 1990, by the way. Um, and then the base is labdanum, leather, musk, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, and cedar. This is before he really honed in on his minimalist style. There's a lot of notes here, as were many uh, ma older masculine fragrances. Um, but it is a little bit interesting to me that, you know, people will pay thousands of dollars for uh, a Jean-Claude Elena Frederick Mall. Well, maybe not thousands, but definitely... Um, well into the hundreds of dollars of, uh, you know, of Frederick Mall or some of these older Herm Hermes fragrances. Um, but they won't pay, I got this for like $7.50 on uh, Fragrance X or something uh, a year ago when they were having a sale. And this is a really interesting fragrance. I'm going to wear it more now that spring is here and it's kind of... Um, you know, heated up a bit, but but there's this mixture of, I mentioned this cumin-like opening, um, and then there's a beautiful powdery floralness that tends to sneak up on you, and I do love florals when they're done properly, and here they really feel like they are done properly with good ingredients, and value for money for this type of fragrance is through the roof. So again, it's only 15 ml, but um, when you have a huge collection, sometimes you don't always need 100 ml bottles. So that's the first one, 1990 Rochas Globe. Now, we're going to go to the House of Hermes. And this is a collaboration that he did with two other perfumers in, in 1998. I have a vintage bottle, but I hear the modern formula is quite good as well. And uh, this is a fragrance called Rocobar. Now... Sorry for the dirty glass there. Let me grab my microfiber cloth. Okay, now Roco Bar comes wrapped in a horse blanket. Uh, I don't have the blanket. I never had it. I bought this as a partial. Uh, this is a splash. This is the um, Eau de Toilette. It's not an aftershave. It is the Eau de Toilette, as you can see right there. Um, and this is what the bottles look like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then they switched them over to the bottle. I'll show you what the bottle looks like um, 
with the, with the bottle now, what it looks like now. Um, but this has this horse stable smell um, because this is supposed to harken back to uh, Hermes's, um, you know, they were known for like their leather saddles and, and leather goods around around the um, the horse uh, equest equestrarian, I guess you would call it. Um, you know, the sport of, um, of, of, uh, of horse, not, not necessarily just racing, but, um, you know, they were like a high-end, uh, horse leather brand. They made stirrups and saddles and stuff like that. And this harkens back to that. Um, and hence the horse blanket that this came wrapped in. Um, sorry, it took me 12 hours to describe that, but, um, this does have a very fresh opening to me. It has this uh, juniper really jumps out in the opening with bergamot, the citruses, lemon, uh, and then you get this very interesting, this very interesting note of cypress, and cypress and perfume doesn't get used enough, you know, it's a really interesting green woody type note, and you get a beautiful cypress here, this is one of the best cypress fragrances with this, um, mixture of carnation, which again, I love. This is right towards the end of the time. You didn't see much carnation after 99 in, in men's sense. Carnation and violet. Uh, and then the base has this ambery, you know, this ambery benzoin thing with old school oak moss and then balsam fir. So it just feels like you're outside in, in, in beautiful greenery. You know, there's forests, there's animals, there's, you know, it feels like you're part of nature when you wear this scent. And I'm uh, very glad to have an old bottle, but I hear that the new formulations are quite good. When we get to the uh, later Hermes fragrances with the um, newer bottles, I'll show you what the, the new bottle looks like if you've never seen it. You could just go to Parfumo and you'll see all three versions um, listed. And mine is starting to kind of, um, it's starting to come off the, the lettering, but I'm very happy to have this. Um, I wear this mostly in like the transition season, so spring. I, I would I love wearing Roca Bar. Um, very easy to wear scent, and for when it came out in the late '90s, when everyone else was doing aquatic stuff, have to respect Hermes uh, releasing a scent like this. It's not my favorite Hermes that's coming up, uh, but um, this one's definitely worth mentioning. And this was before he was in-house perfumer. Okay. Next, we're going to jump to the year 2011, and this is a little mini that I have. Uh, it's a 15 ml. I like that they do these little small bottles. You know, it's something to have around if you if you get into these kind of intellectual times where you want to wear something, but you don't need a full bottle kind of thing. Uh, and this is called Un Jardin sur le toit. Un Jardin sur le Toit. And um, this is a very interesting, fresh scent. This is perfect for the dog days of summer when it's just ungodly hot like it gets here in Texas. Um, this has this very fresh, very green feeling to it because what he's done is he's used pear and apple, but he's also contrasted that with pear tree wood and apple wood. So you get the pear and you get the fruitiness of the apple, but then you also get the woodiness of pear tree wood with the apple wood. Uh, very um, unique fresh fragrances. Most fresh fragrances are boring uh, to me. This is not boring. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, keeps my attention, you know, for a freshie. It doesn't last very long on me anyways. You get four hours or whatever it is, four to five hours, but... Um, you know, you just reapply. I just reapply fragrances like this. I don't care. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all to uh, to reapply. And when you have these little bottles like this, it's very easy to just carry it with you and, you know, reapply it will, basically. So that's a 2011 release. And then we're going to jump to 2012. The EDT came out in 2010. This came out a couple years later. And this is called Voyage de Hermes. And this is almost like the, whoops, I guess I should turn it the right way for you guys, huh? So this is almost like the black sheep of the Hermes fragrance family. Amazing uh, bottle, by the way. Very unique. 
bottle. You flip it this way if you want to spray it. And, and then when you're done, you know, you flip it back and it sits, you know, like so. Uh, and this fragrance is, is where the simplicity of Jean-Claude Elena's creations really start to come in because it has basically only three or four notes to my nose. There's amber, uh, there is some freshness from juniper berry, and there's cardamom, and then there's cinnamon. So you get this spiciness from cardamom and cinnamon, you get this freshness from juniper, but then it's all wrapped up in that amber base. And um, if you like fragrances like La Nuit de Lome, I would highly recommend you check this out. I, I don't own a bottle of La Nuit de Lome. It doesn't really do it for me uh, because when I want cardamom, I, I, I would much rather wear this uh, or there's a Jacques Bogart fragrance called um, Riviera Nights that has a beautiful cardamom note. And then, of course, there's a bunch of amouages that I have that have cardamom in them as well. But um, even though, actually, cardamom is not listed as a note here in Parfumo, uh, but I get a cardamom note from this big time. And so, um, it's, it's not the most revolutionary fragrance or anything, but not all fragrances have to be a Mozart. You know, they don't they don't have to have 25 notes. So, and, and that's something that I kind of learned as I progressed in my journey. Um, I have the Parfum. Uh, I like the Parfum a little bit more than the EDT just because it's a little bit heavier. It adds a little bit more weight. The EDT just felt a little light to me when I sampled it. Uh, so I prefer the Parfum, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with the EDT. They're both great fragrances. And then we're gonna to get to my favorite Jean-Claude Elena of all time, hands down, it's not even a question, okay? And that is Bellamy Vetiver. Bellamy Vetiver is hands down my favorite Jean-Claude Elena creation ever, of all his creations I've ever smelled. Now, I haven't smelled Rose and Queer, uh, believe it or not. Um, and he did a fantastic job of keeping the original Bellamy intact. Now, this is an old shaker bottle. This is arguably my favorite fragrance of all time. He didn't create this. He created a flanker off of Bellamy called Bellamy Vetiver that keeps that Bellamy leather um, and woods and adds vetiver to the mix. Now, Fragrantica has a note of civet listed in Bellamy Vetiver. I don't know if I get much civet. If, if, if I do, you know, it's there as a complementary part of the strategy. It's not the focal point or anything. And I used to think because this has civet, you can only wear it in the winter. It is beautiful in the winter. It's a leather, but um, I think it also works in other seasons. And I think this would be an amazing signature scent personally. Um, this would be an absolute amazing, if I had a signature scent, this would definitely be in the running. I wish I had more than one bottle of this. The artwork in the back is absolutely stunning. Uh, the bottle, th these are the new bottles that Roca Bar comes in nowadays, by the way. I hear they're quite good. And this is the fragrance where he was more heavy-handed. This is a very heavy leather um, oily leather. My, well, this is my favorite leather. It has this very, you know, worn in leather type smell, you know, like you are, um, like you're getting on a, um, my uncle used to have this boat that had these leather seats on them and it would sit out in the sun all day under a tarp, you know, and when you pulled that tarp off and you sat on the leather, you could see the lines in the leather from where, People sat on the leather over the years, and it had this very worn type smell. There was a wood dashboard on the boat with the steering wheel, and you know, that old wood mixed with the leather. That's what you get from the original Bellamy. And he kept that, you know, he kept that uh, DNA with the flanker. This is a true flanker of Bellamy. This is one of my favorite examples of a proper flanker, by the way. And usually he's very light handed. Um, very minimalist in style. He went very heavy here. He kind of went against his, um, his preferred style, if you will. 
And I really appreciate that because he kept true to the 80s powerhouse that Bel Ami is. I love Bel Ami to, to death. I have three bottles of this. Uh, not this version. This is the only shaker bottle that I have. But I have um, two other bottles of this in the, not this version, but the second reformulation of Bel Ami, which is my favorite um, it's my favorite version. I think they, and maybe Jean-Claude Elena was responsible for that. Also, I should mention that. Um, he did a great job keeping these fragrances um, up to date, keeping them, you know, keeping them up to date with the standards, with Ifra and all the other stuff he had to do. And, um, but this flanker is an amazing amazing fragrance. This is a 10 out of 10. If I if I gave ratings, the original Bellamy is an 11 out of 10, um, which I don't give ratings. The original Bellamy would be an 11 out of 10. This would be a 10 out of 10. Um, just because for me, it just is so close to my heart. I, I am so, I am so in love with these two fragrances. I need to wear them more. I need to make a point of wearing my favorites. Like I said, I haven't worn Santos in 10 months. It's a travesty. Uh, cause I'm wearing all this other stuff. Uh, someone wrote me a letter or a note, uh, on my comments and said, Hey, you're making a lot of videos. Don't make so many and run out of ideas. And I said, I have so many ideas for videos. You have no idea. I took the, um, I got all these lucky scent samples of fragrances that I've, I haven't smelled. I'll never use those lucky scent little dabbers. And some of the ones that I had, like two, three, four, five different Lucky Scent, scent little half ml, one ml vials, I poured them into a spray so I can actually start to test them. So I'll do first impressions on some fragrances I've never smelled. Um, Naxos and some other Zerzhoffs. I'm not a fan of Zerzhoff, but um, I still haven't, I've never smelled them. So I'll do first impressions. So I've got a bunch of videos lined up to do. So don't worry about me running out of content. Okay, next we are going to go to... The only Hermescence uh, that I own, and I'll tell you what, I wore this a couple weeks ago for the first time as my scent of the day, and as the day went on, I enjoyed it more and more and more. Um, it's basically this powdery floral leather. It's, it's, it's the complete opposite leather of Bellamy. Okay, so Bellamy is this rough, uh, oily leather. This is almost like this, it's almost like this tan white leather that you get. Um, there's a note of hawthorn, it's florals, um, and there's leather, so Parfumo only shows two notes, hawthorn and leather, but I get this cumin at the top, which he used in declaration to perfection, um, and, you know, he really learned that cumin note, I think, from the master, Edmund Rudnitska, was the in-house perfumer of Hermes, where Eau de Hermes has made the best cumin fragrance of all time. Take that to the bank. I know that's opinionated, but too bad. It's my it's my channel. Uh, and Quid Ange, I thought I wouldn't care for it as much. Uh, I got a great deal on this tester bottle, so I said, you know, I'm, I'm a leather lover. I have to get, I have to have Quid Ange, especially when people like Zhao were saying that this is the best leather of all time in his collection. I said, okay, I have to, I have to have Quid Ange, so I got it. And um, at first, I thought, okay, it's kind of what I expected. I, it, I'm not, um, I didn't love it immediately. Like when I smelled Bellamy, it was love at first sniff, um, and I love it just as much now as I did the first time I ever smelled it. This, the first time I smelled it, I kind of shrugged. But after giving it a full wear, I realized that even though it's minimalist in style, it's, it's, it's a Jean-Claude Elena through and through, this has a lot of different layers to break down. And I started to realize it spelled different as my body chemistry heated up. Um, you know, it, um, it, it changed, it morphed. I started to see complexity in the leather, started to see complexity in the spices, in the flowers. Um, there's an orris note here that gives off this very powdery type feel. There's no orris note listed in Parfumo, but there's definitely orris here. So, um, you know, if you're a leather fan and you want some different facets to leather, these two that he did are absolute stunners as far as the leather category go. Um, I am a big fan of both of these leather fragrances. 
Um, Bell Ami is obviously my favorite, but don't overlook Queer Orange. It's it's a different style, but it is um, it's done it's done very well, very very well. Um, now. I want to talk to you guys about the final uh, Jean-Claude Elena fragrance, and this is going to be a fragrance called Equipage Geranium. Now, this is another very simplistic fragrance according to Parfumo, but I think there's more going on than, than is listed. I have the original Equipage in the vintage bottle. It looked like this, and you can see how they used to do the batch codes in the old days. And look at this cap, this wheel, giant wheel cap. Um, I struggle with equipage. This is a Guy Robert perfume. Uh, and I will tell you that I am going to do a comparison video for you guys between these two one day, maybe when it heats up a little bit. Um, and I can tell you that just from initial smell, wearing it to bed, uh, Equipage Geranium is, is an improvement to Equipage for me. Um, now, is it an improvement so much that I think it's worth me getting this full bottle? That is, we'll, we'll have to talk more about that in the comparison video I do. But Jean-Claude Elena took Equipage and he did the same thing that he did with uh, Bellamy Vetiver in that he stayed true to the DNA of uh, equipage and he made a true flanker of this he added geranium and he added this sandalwood base which um, the sandalwood base is very multifaceted it seemed um, you know it almost seemed alive in a sense uh, very spicy very floral but um, if I had to keep one, I think I would probably keep uh, Equipage Geranium right now. However, I need to do more testing. Um, you know, I only wore this a couple times la uh, a year, maybe two years ago when I got this. I only wore this a couple times, and I wasn't the biggest fan, to be honest with you. It, um, it, it... It, it feels the most dated. Of all these older fragrances that I have, Equipage feels the most dated. Uh, and not in a good way. Almost like Chanel Pour Monsieur EDT feels dated to me. Uh, but I will, I will do a comparison video for you guys and we'll talk about that. Now, let's switch to Christine Nigel. You'll notice something about my collection with her. I don't have any... Um, I don't have any of her fragrances from uh, Hermes. I don't like H24. Um, I don't care for Lalique White, which was kind of like a hype beast in a decade ago. I don't have Twilly, although Eugene loves Twilly de Hermes. I don't have it. Um, I don't have any of her Terre de Hermes flankers. You'll notice I don't own Ter other also, which is uh, probably Jean-Claude Elena's biggest hit. Um, so there's a lot of fragrances. I, I need to try some of the, uh, L'Ombre de Mer... Uh, Merveille, I think they call it. Uh, I need to try some of those fragrances that uh, Christine Najel did, but um, I only have two, and they're not Hermes fragrances. One is actually a Thierry Mugler fragrance, and it's called B Men. Comes in this little, this is a little travel atomizer, by the way. Um, but B Men came out in 2004, and she worked on this with Jacques Houclier which made all of basically the Amen flankers. And so she worked on this with Jacques Houclier, and uh, they created this, um, this fragrance here in 2004. Now, there is a big similarity to my nose between this and a fragrance that I absolutely love and have two bottles of, and that is the 1999 version of Yoshi Holm. Now, this came out, like I said, in 99, so five years earlier. It has this little thing to stop it from spraying. This is my backup bottle. Um, and you can see the small ingredient list right there. If you buy this fragrance, be careful because there's a lot of iterations, um, a lot of reformulations, a lot of terrible reformulations. But if you like Yoji Ohm, um, 
you you will probably like B Men. B Men has that same vibe to me. It doesn't have liquor. I don't think there's a rum note in Yoshi Home. This uses rhubarb instead. And so there is rhubarb with fruits and spices. There's a sequoia note in here, which sequoia is a wood that's hardly ever used in perfumery. So there's vetiver, sequoia, amber, spices, fruits, and rhubarb. Uh, but it gives off this soft, spicy vibe. And you get that in um, Yoji Home. So I like this DNA, but it's probably not full bottle worthy to me because I have the Yoshi Home, which I actually prefer. I think they play in the same ballpark, but all of these, these, these two, both of these are discontinued, by the way, but you can still find them. Uh, there's not a lot of hype, uh, and, and, um, you know, some of the famous perfume critics, we will say, uh, absolutely love Yoji Home. It, it, it was a big hit among some uh, famous perfume critics, let's say. But um, B-Men is also worth a recommendation. I like it. I'm glad I have this little travel atomizer for, you know, curiosity to wear occasionally. Um, but again, if I wanted to really wear this DNA, I'd probably go for Yoshi Home. So the creation that Christine Nigel made that I like the most uh, is this. And I've shown this on my channel before. This is a Lalique. And this is supposed to celebrate their 20 year anniversary of making fragrances. They've been making bottles, gosh, um, 120 something years, I think. Uh, they've been making bottles forever. Uh, and um, Lalique was the next door neighbor of Francois Coty. So, you know, there was a, uh, he was a jewelry maker. He started making bottles. Coty had a place to house his perfumes in and these amazing um, flacons, if you will. Uh, but I like this fragrance because this came out in 2011 and this is Lalique's take on an oud fragrance. But it's a very Western, easy to wear oud uh, in this beautiful Tesseract-like bottle. Look at this bottle. Amazing bottle. Um, so it's in this Tesseract-like bottle, and um, it uses some Middle Eastern notes like saffron and oud and pimento leaf, but they use a violet leaf accord. And um, I was trying to think of some violet leaf fragrances. I'll, I'll do it. This is not a top 10 violet leaf one day for you guys. But, you know, violet leaf is um, used in kind of the ozonic it gives off this very ozonic-like feel. It's used in Fahrenheit, famously, and Jeffrey Bean's Gray Flannel. Uh, those are two of probably the most popular violet leaf um, fragrances. I will also throw in Amouage um, Portrayal Man, which is one of the last ones Christopher Chong did as creative director before he left. That has a gorgeous violet leaf opening. And the violet leaf here is, is beautiful as well, but it goes into the Middle Eastern musk oud saffron type category and uh, it's actually a really easy oud fragrance to wear believe it or not lalique is such an underrated house for what you get for the for the price um value for money on a fragrance like this is through the roof there's a flanker of this that christine nigel did not do um and i think michelle almarac did it called voyage that uses the note of papyrus and um papyrus if you like that dark vetiver papyrus type feel um you can check out the flanker but i'd probably recommend trying private label if that's kind of the route you want to go but um check this one out if you've never gotten your nose on it it can still be had for cheap <clears throat> excuse me i don't know if it's still being created or not but um this is probably my you know one of my favorites from uh christine nagel so that is my perfumers portfolio video I hope you've appreciated it. I know I'm missing a lot of Jean-Claude Elena and Christine Nigel fragrances. If there's any I should focus on, please let me know. And I'd love to hear your feedbacks on the ones that I do have. Uh, I love seeing your faces in the comment and the comments. And uh, as always, you know, a like and a subscription is always appreciated, but you don't have to if you don't feel like liking or subscribing. I'm not doing this to become YouTube famous or anything like that. I'm doing this just to highlight the 
art of perfumery and you know my love of of that art form so thank you very much for watching and cheers i'll see you again tomorrow with another video Bye bye